An 18-year-old from Australia became one of the youngest Westerners to ever join the biggest extremist organization in recent memory. What led him to this, and what eventually happened to him? Jake Bilardi was born on December 1st in 1996 in a town called Craigieburn in Australia. In a blog he would go on to write as a teenager, he would describe his upbringing as very comfortable, taking place in some suburbs near Melbourne. He was the youngest of six siblings in a family that seemed very normal to most. He was raised as an atheist in a family that valued their studies and dreamed of becoming a political journalist one day. He was a shy, timid kid who was reported to have been bullied by the kids around him. But despite this, he was a model student and was seen as somewhat of a math genius. However, as he entered into his teens, he gradually began to change. He entered into a new phrase where he didn't really want to be talked too much and didn't really want his friends to have anything to do with him. By the time he reached his 18th birthday, he had changed greatly. Over time, his mind had been warped. The people around him were weary to interact with him too much. One fellow student would later recount a story about Jake lashing out in anger, trying to punch him for seemingly unknown reasons. Jake's father would later on say that his son suffered from noticeable psychological problems from a fairly young age, but admitted to never addressing them, despite seeing some clear warning signs in his behavior. One of the biggest influences on Jake's life was his older brother's interest in international politics. This topic particularly resonated with Jake, especially after the September 11th attacks. At the time of the attacks, Jake was only five years old. However, like many of us, he was gripped with morbid curiosity. This curiosity would last with him until much later in life when he decided to research the topic further. My knowledge of the operation was basically non-existent. Despite this, I was immediately drawn to the topics of Al-Qaeda and Islamic terrorism, he would say. It was from here that my research into Al-Qaeda and groups with similar ideologies worldwide began. I spent every day researching online and reading the books I had begun collecting. Jake's quotes are taken from a blog that he wrote online called From the Eyes of a Muhajir. This blog has since been deleted, but mirrors do remain online, and that's where most of his quotes in this video are taken from. But before getting too deep into that, it was actually his presence on Yahoo Answers, of all places, that originally began to raise concerns. He was a very regular user, and the gradual change in his questions reflected his gradually changing alignment. In his early teens, most of his questions revolved around pretty mundane topics. Things like, is Russia part of Europe or Asia? Others were about pretty harmless topics as well, such as questions about Microsoft Word, the Grand Prix, or tennis. But eventually politics came more into play. Are you against the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq? He asked, showing an interest in hearing what Westerners in particular thought about these wars. After that, he would slowly start to ask questions that painted his country in a less than stellar light, such as, do you think Australia is racist? Political views aside, his deteriorating psychological health began to become more evident in other ways. In a post unrelated to politics or religion, he wrote that he felt that his family might be plotting to kill him and that hidden cameras were watching him. It was suggested that he see a psychologist, and he seemed to welcome the suggestion. However, there's no evidence that he took the suggestion to heart in the end. Around this time, he revealed that he had converted to Islam, previously never having been religious. He began attending an Islamic youth center in Melbourne, but he failed to interact very much with the other members. They would describe him as a very quiet guy who stuck to himself. He evidently began to struggle with his new belief system and found it somewhat difficult to integrate into the life and culture he was raised in. Can I celebrate Christmas still? He asked. Is it halal, meaning permissible, for me to pray in the classroom during a lesson? He also asked, seemingly finding it difficult to fit the customary daily prayers into his schedule. According to his friends, he began feeling concern with the non-religious nature of his family as well, and often worried if they would spend eternity in hell for being non-believers. As time passed, his Yahoo Answers account began showing signs of someone who was attracted to a more extremist ideology. 
He often wrote in defense of both Afghanistan and the Taliban, saying, There is only one Islamic state between Iraq and Syria, implying that this country was the only one to hold, quote, true Islamic law. Around this time, he started his blog and began to write about his views on religion, his distaste for the West and their interaction in the Middle East, namely the United States, and about his gradual process of radicalization. He spoke of reading of the wars in the Middle East, mainly the war on terror and abuses committed by the occupying forces. This, he said, was what caused him to lose respect for his own culture and gain respect for the other. He admitted that he educated himself on the topic of Islam and radical beliefs by following the news written by who he called the Mujahideen, the Islamic fighters. A while into writing the blog, his mother would unfortunately pass away due to cancer. This really sped up the process of radicalization. Some would even say it was the main cause of the radicalization. His family at least believed this to be the case. He's just a young boy that went looking for something after he lost someone very, very dear to him, his mother. By 2014, ISIS itself was in full swing and Jake was expressing sympathy for Osama bin Laden on his Facebook account. He originally actually condemned ISIS, saying that they were, quote, falling for the many lies being spread against them. But this gave him an interest in talking to some of their members online. After making some connections and seeing some of their military success stories on the news, his opinion towards them began to change. He started mulling around the idea of leaving the country and heading off to join Islamic State himself. He became very concerned that the Australian government was monitoring his online activity and may cancel his passport. As a consequence of this paranoia, he began stockpiling bomb building components at his home. If he couldn't join the fight overseas, he felt that he may have to take the fight home. He started to view democracy as nothing but a system of lies and deception, one which focuses heavily on providing the people with so-called freedom but throws celebrities and false reality into the spotlight to distract people from what is really going on in the world. He said that continuing to read this material about the wars in the Middle East was what caused him to come to hate his own system. It was also the moment I realized that violent global revolution was necessary to eliminate this system of governance and that I would likely be killed in this struggle, he said. Very often we're looking at, particularly with teenagers, people who have been identified, who have been groomed, and somebody has set up their travel and, 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 and purchased a ticket for them. And the message will be, you can leave your boring classrooms and your dumb friends and the kids who don't like you and your parents who don't understand you and come and be with the real fighters, you can be a hero. After talking with members of the organization for a while online, Jake was finally able to make contact with someone in August of 2014 that promised to be able to get him into their territory. Something that would have been pretty difficult under normal circumstances. His final questions on Yahoo Answers were about getting a one-way ticket to Turkey and about getting some help with his passport application. Shortly after, he was flying out of Australia. After his sudden leave, his family searched his room and came across several of his devices and, in turn, the disturbing warning signs that were left on them. They called the authorities, who then began tracking his movements. They cancelled his Australian passport, but it was too late. He was already gone. He shut down most of his social media accounts and many of his posts have since been lost. But for the time being, he kept an account on, what else, Twitter where he would, in typical Twitter fashion, post veiled threats and harass other users. Occasionally, he'd give an update on his location or his plans. He began going by the name Abu Abdullah al Australi, almost exclusively. A while after arriving, a BBC reporter managed to make contact with him, interested in talking to Westerners who had joined the group. This was shortly after a picture of him had appeared online, but even so, he asked the reporter not to reveal his identity. It was the first time he had been questioned on all of this. Actually joking about it, he told the reporter, I'm a young white guy with no criminal record. Doesn't scream terrorist, does it? Ha ha ha. It turned out he didn't even know about the photo of him being leaked to the public, but he didn't seem to be too upset, saying, It's out now. I guess to be honest, my biggest problem is that it's a bad photo of me. Ha ha. 
He refused to go into great detail as to how exactly he entered their territory, but he was eager to talk about his reaction upon entering the city of Gerablus. Sorry, comment section. In Syria, saying that he felt a certain kind of joy that he had never experienced before. He had actually written about it in his blog as well, in a post called Being White in the Islamic State, the Abolition of Racism. He would say that, Islamic State has been successful in eliminating racism and in building the world's only true multi-ethnic state. But this is where the interview with the reporter got pretty morbid. He said he was going to carry out, let's call it a self-destruct attack. Don't blame me, blame you too. He said that he was in Ramadi, Iraq and had been in Islamic State for about four months now. A lot of the rhetoric he used was pretty typical of Western members. It sounded like he was talking uh, straight out of a propaganda ad. He expressed hatred for the Shias that he helped fight in Iraq and praised attacks on Australia back home. For one reason or another, he didn't really want to get into exactly how he ended up converting to Islam and wasn't interested in talking about his life back home. He did say that his family hated his religion, and he felt that really all non-Muslims actually did. He also mentioned his previous interest in politics and his hatred of international organizations like the United Nations. He was asked why he didn't try to resolve his perceived injustices in the world through democratic means. To this, he responded, Let's be honest, you can stand on a street and scream about wanting change and wait maybe a hundred years for things to happen, or you can grab a gun and fight and change things quickly. When joining the group, he made it known that he wanted to blow himself up for the cause. After making the offer, he was quickly rushed through military training. I came here chasing death. I might as well kill as many kafar, uh, meaning non-believers, as I can, he would say. He was asked about how he felt that this death would affect his family back home. He didn't care and responded coldly, I've got a job to do. I didn't come here to hand out roses and boxes of chocolates. One of his last posts on the blog, written under his new name, Abu Abdullah al Australi, which seems to have been originally posted on January 13th of 2015, said that he was preparing to sacrifice his life for Islam in Ramadi. He would always ask the emir to push him up the list and make him carry out the martyrdom operation sooner, said an Islamic State propagandist named Abu Ismail. In the time leading up to his final day, according to Ismail, Jake was reportedly so full of happiness as he was finally going to meet his lord and receive the great rewards promised by him. The day of the 11th of March in 2015 finally came. And on this day, Jake would end his own life in a car bombing attack in Ramadi. The attack was completely unsuccessful. He killed only himself and nobody else, accomplishing absolutely nothing. The group wouldn't go on to comment on the attack as being either a success or a failure, nor did they provide any proof that Jake himself had carried it out, but they did credit it to him and the Australian government believed it was likely to be the truth. IS would then go on to take his death and use it to craft more propaganda, hoping to use it to recruit some more members to die in the way that he did. They further used it to shame boys who were born into Muslim families, telling them that the foreigner converts were even more dedicated than them, the born Muslims, hoping to make them feel obligated to throw away their own lives as well. The propaganda described Jake as a lion on the battlefield, although he was at a young age and with a weak body. Abu Ismail would later add that IS needs true men like him who wish to sacrifice this worldly life for the hereafter. Jake's story would spread around the world and the media would soon dub him as Jihadi Jake. He was widely considered to be one of the youngest recruits to ISIS from a western nation. However, his circumstances were notably different from most of the other Western recruits. His background was seen as symbolizing more of issues with youth culture rather than issues with ideology. An expert on radicalization at the Australian National University named Clark Jones would state that Jake blew away the profile of what most people think of when they think of people who are going to support the Islamic State. He noted that his case was unique and that he doesn't seem to have ever been groomed by anyone from the organization itself. Instead, he actually struggled to make contact with any extremists. 
He mainly radicalized himself by actively seeking out the content written by extremists and absorbing as much as he could. His path towards extremism was seen as being motivated more by underlying mental health issues than religious belief. It was later revealed by authorities that his previous plan to make bombs was somewhat more developed than they had originally led on. He had plans to attack several targets across Melbourne in the event that his plan to move abroad failed. The Prime Minister of Australia at the time, Tony Abbott, commented on Jake's death, saying that it was an absolutely horrific situation and that, it's very, very important that we do everything we can to try to safeguard our young people against the lure of this shocking, alien, and extreme ideology. That month, in March of 2015, the government made it a criminal offense for any Australian civilians to enter into the Islamic State capital of Mosul without any sort of reason that was seen as legitimate, such as visiting family. Simply going there could have gotten you up to 10 years in prison. Very shortly after this was put into place, two brothers were detained at a Sydney airport, suspected of heading to join IS. As the two boys, aged 16 and 17, went through customs, they were caught and eventually released to their parents without formally being charged. Later that year in December, it was further made illegal for any Australians to enter into the Syrian province of Al Raqqa as well. Clark Jones said that Jake's fate was pretty typical of foreign recruits into the organization. He felt that Jake was seeking some sort of validation and recognition that he felt denied back home. He wanted that religious prize, he said. Once again, thank you for watching my video. As usual, likes and subscribes are good. I have a feeling that YouTube is really going to kick my ass on this episode. Uh, this is my first recording through... I don't know what I'm going to have to cut out or censor. I, I hate censoring, but uh, when it comes to this topic, yeah, there's just no way to get around it, usually. So, uh, please bear with me on that one. I know it sucks. I know it's dumb. That's it. It just, it just sucks and it's dumb. If you want to support the channel even further, I still got that Patreon in the description below. And speaking of which, let's shout out the top patrons. Jewel G. Wafrans, Callahan, Jules Latona, Arctic Cat, Alan Damiani, Adrian Lawley, Winnicott, Murray Joel Sanchez, David McLaughlin, Marsh, Buffazerk, Lon Rowe, Jewel Mavchan, Lori Tayaba, Kim Peek, Lux Alpaca, Charity, Skooky Maine, Fox Licity, Jackie, Teresa Ferguson, and Mark Barnett. Thank you. Good night.